Hi, I'm Isra, and I can remember nothing that happened to me prior to the accident. Have you ever felt that you were not yourself? That everything around you is artificial and unreal? That people around you are lying to you? This is my life now. Please watch this video to the end, and you will see how hard it is when you are not even sure who you really are. I'm only sure of a few things. I know for a fact that I'm 23, and that my parents are dead. This is confirmed by the papers that I read myself lately. I don't remember any of this, neither my mom and dad, nor even a single birthday party. The last actual memory that I can recall is a steering wheel in my hands. That chilling sensation of losing control and flying, the impact, and the rattle of metal, and then nothing but darkness and pain. When I first woke up, I had no idea what was going on. I felt my body as if it was not my own. I could hardly understand what was happening. I had a tube in my mouth. I felt so weak. I couldn't see their faces clearly. Everything was blurred. They noticed that I was conscious, and one of them ran to me. Molly, can you hear me? He asked. And then, my world collapsed again. The second time I woke up, there was no medical appliances around anymore. A man I didn't know sat next to me, holding my hand gently. Isra, darling, he said. Finally, you're awake. Who, who are you? I asked. I'm Trevor, your husband, he replied. But I couldn't remember being married. I saw this man for the first time. But then again, I couldn't remember anything at all. I was not even sure that Isra is my real name. It sounded so weird. I was injured in the accident badly. The recovery took long. Doctors told us that after such a severe concussion, those gaps in memory are normal and shouldn't surprise us. Trevor came to see me every day, brought me photos. We were talking about my past, but I still had no recollection of anything. It was awful. Trevor held on and tried to support me on my rehabilitation. But that name, Molly, it was haunting me. And for some reason, I didn't dare ask Trevor about it. As I started to recover, police came to me. They were investigating the accident. They suspected that the car accident was rigged by someone. Moreover, remains of another person were found at the crash site. But I couldn't tell them anything. All I knew was what Trevor had told me. The car fell off a cliff, rolled over several times, and caught fire. I was able to get out. Was there someone with me? Who was it? I don't know. I can't remember. Over time I got better but still felt completely disoriented. Trevor took me home. We had a nice little cottage and two cats. The cats sniffed me and hissed at me. Trevor laughed and said it was probably the smell of my medication. I had to start from scratch. My parents died about five years ago. So unfortunately, there was no one to ask about my childhood. I couldn't forget about the other person in the car, but Trevor told me not to worry and let the police handle it. I felt guilty. Trevor tried so hard, but I didn't feel anything for him or for this house or for this life. Well, at least I started getting along with the cats. It turned out that I graduated from college recently and now work as a teacher in a junior school. Doctors advised me to return to my normal life as soon as possible in order to bring back my memories. The school administration wanted to help me. The classes were taught by substitute teachers, but I came to the class, talked to the children, read the academic curriculum. Did I write those lesson plans with my own hand? Did I really give marks to these lovely kids? My head is spinning. One of my students asked how my twin sister was doing. I was stunned. The girl said she saw me shortly before the accident in the other town with my twin. We were eating in a cafe and arguing. I asked Trevor if I had a sister. He said no, and became very grim. As time went on, physically I was all right. My memories remained locked, but I started to get new ones. Together with Trevor and our cats, we celebrated my 24th birthday. We started dating, and I realized that I was beginning to fall in love with my husband. I may never get my old self back again, but that doesn't mean I should give up on life. It doesn't mean that I can't start from scratch. I mean, right?
Then one day, when Trevor left for work for a few days, a man with flowers met me after school. Molly, he exclaimed. Don't you recognize me? I'm Dick, your husband. I was terrified. Who is this madman? But his face looked familiar to me. I knew him from somewhere. And the flowers in his hands, the daisies, there was something about them. I got a terrible headache. I stumbled, and the stranger, Dick, caught me up and led me to a bench. He kept saying that I was Molly, his beloved beauty, that Trevor didn't let us meet because he knew I'd remember everything. I was so confused. Can it be that Trevor was lying to me all this time? But why? Dick said that I received an inheritance from my aunt recently, and Trevor wanted the money. I couldn't believe it. How could my sweet, gentle, caring Trevor do such a thing to me? It felt like I couldn't trust anyone, neither Trevor nor Dick. Even if his face evoked some kind of response, I didn't know what to do. I asked Dick to take me to the house where I currently lived. Dick was not happy, but obeyed. At night, I had a dream of my reflection, all bruised and in tears, surrounded by daisies. Is that me? Is it Molly? Who am I? Am I really Molly, or am I Isra? Have you ever looked in the mirror and wondered who you are? In the morning, I woke up determined to figure out what was going on. I went through piles of old photos. I hoped something would spark some memory, but it didn't help. Then I got into my car and drove to the other town, where my student had seen me before the accident. I found that cafe, ordered a coffee, and started looking through the window. It seemed to trigger some memories. This place looked familiar to me. Oh, Molly, the owner of the cafe called me. You haven't been here for a long time. We started talking. I told her that I'd gotten a car accident and have a memory loss now, and she told me that I used to live in this town. I often came to drink coffee here. And I had no husband. What about Dick? I asked. Dick, the old lady raised her eyebrows. Good grief, honey. How did that scoundrel find you? I got a headache again. The old lady told me that the first time we met, I ran into this cafe and asked her to hide me from a guy who was angry at me. My headache became worse. And what about my sister? I asked. I'm not crazy. The old woman confirmed that I have a sister, or had, and that my sister was trying to convince me to break up with my boyfriend. So I am not Isra? Am I Molly for real? Could it be that Trevor was actually wrong? I thanked the old lady and went home. Trevor came back. I asked him about Molly and told him what I'd learned in the other town. He got angry. He shouted that all our troubles were because of my sister and her boyfriend, that if it wasn't for her, nothing would have happened to me. Why did he lie to me? How could he keep in secret such an important part of my life? I didn't know what to do. I decided that I should move out of Trevor's house. He didn't hold me, only asked me to keep in touch with him. I asked who my inheritance was from, and he looked so genuinely surprised. There was no inheritance. The money that Molly and I, or Isra and I, inherited after our parents' death, we divided in half. Mine were spent on college, while she invested her funds in real estate. It seemed that Trevor either didn't know about the inheritance or was a very convincing liar. I couldn't trust him anymore. I lived on my own for a few weeks. I began to remember my childhood, my parents, but my sister and I were almost always together. I couldn't tell if I was Molly or Isra. Dick tried to pick me up after school again. I told him to go away and threatened to call the police. He got mad and promised that I would regret it. A couple of days later, my car brakes failed. I almost got into an accident again, survived only thanks to the airbag. I lost consciousness. I woke up in the hospital again, but now I remembered everything. I am Isra. That day, I came to pick up my sister from the other town. Even though Trevor didn't want her to stay with us, he was afraid that Dick, who was stalking her, would threaten us. Our distant relative died and left my sister and me a small inheritance. I gave my share to Molly so she could leave the country and start a new life. And I didn't tell Trevor about it, knowing it would only irritate him. 
I was driving my sister home and my brakes failed. And then there was an accident. Dick got arrested. He was the one who messed up the brakes both times. Trevor didn't want to tell me about my sister. He was afraid I'd want to deal with Dick myself. Or maybe I could blame him for my sister's death. It took me a long time to forgive Trevor for his secretiveness. But we finally made up. Sometimes I still wonder, what if I'm not Isra, but Molly? But I guess I'll never be 100% sure about my true self ever again. Who would you believe if you lost your memory? Tell us in the comments. If you enjoyed this story, please like it and YouTube will show it to other viewers. Subscribe to the channel not to miss more interesting stories. In the evening, I arrived at the address the detective had given me. As soon as I went inside, I saw homeless people in dirty clothes on the floor. Was this a flop house? One of them grabbed my arm. I looked closer and recognized him. That was my husband, Jim. The fact is that a year ago, he went on a business trip and disappeared. To be honest, I wasn't even upset because we hadn't talked much lately. He was always in his laptop and I had zero attention. Jim was the genius of IT, created some program, sold it to a large corporation, and became a millionaire. But he hid all the money. And he always said that all the most valuable things should be kept in a safe. I tried to get his coat, but Jim was adamant. When Jim disappeared, I honestly wasn't even upset. I decided to find someone who would appreciate me. I started going to clubs and met a nice actor named Robert. He liked to hang out, not like my hubby Jim. However, the money quickly ran out from such a life. Then Robert suggested hiring a private investigator and finding Jim. That was the only way to know the code to his safe. And today, finally, a detective found my husband Jim. Only he didn't say he was a bum now. I needed to find out the code for the safe from him. But I didn't want to do it in front of everyone, so I barely tore my husband away from the other homeless people. Took him outside and pushed him into the car. Jim protested and said something, but I didn't care. On the way, I didn't let Jim get a word in, just told him how much I suffered without him. I also added that I had spent all the money on the detective, and now we needed the code to the safe to pay for all the expenses. But Jim suddenly interrupted me and asked who I was, and what kind of safe I was talking about. I stopped the car abruptly. How is that? I'm your wife. Are you having blackouts? Jim said nothing. At home, I immediately took him to the safe. Well, what are you looking at? Dial the code, just four digits. Jim pressed something, but the code was wrong. I don't remember anything, nothing at all. Jim said softly and sadly. So he really had blackouts? What a surprise. I had no money for a doctor, so I decided to try it myself. Showed him a photo of us together which was on the table. It's me, see, I'm your wife. Come on, remember. Suddenly, he smiled enigmatically and said that he remembered the photo. Looked like we went on a catamaran that day, together. Well, we did that, and what? And then Jim looked at me carefully. I came up with a code for the safe from the numbers that mean important events in my life. And it seems that it was during the walk that I came up with the first number. Hooray, and tomorrow morning, we'll go to the park. I will help you remember everything, dear. Just don't forget to wash up. I sent him to bed. What a klutz he was. Soon, Robert and I would take all his money, and we would be happy. In the morning, Jim was waiting for me at the car. He was clean, clean-shaven, and stylishly dressed. It would be better, of course, to remember the code and be done with it. In the park, Jim took me around some edges and bridges. Yes, Jim, it's so beautiful, but maybe you can remember the first digit of the password. But Jim suddenly took it into his head to ride the decrepit catamarans. Gritting my teeth, I climbed into this boat. It was worth to have a tough time for the money. I had to touch the spray flying from the wheels of the catamaran. Jim noticed how annoyed I was and deliberately swam even faster. Hey, what are you doing? You ruined my hair. I shouted for Jim to turn back to the beach immediately, but he was staring at some swans. I was running out of patience, and I was about to get up to speak when the boat lurched, and I fell into the water. Help me! I can't swim! I went deeper and deeper under the water, and the last thing I heard was a dull splash. When I woke up, I saw Jim standing in front of me, looking flustered. He was all wet and said he could barely get me out of the water. I immediately pushed him away. It's all your fault. The first digit is two like a swan's neck, Jim said happily. What? And the other numbers. But Jim just shrugged. 
Okay, at least that way. But now I needed a warm bath. At home, I locked myself in the bathroom and called Robert. I missed him so much. But he interrupted me and asked about the safe. When he heard that I hadn't got the code yet, he told me to hurry up. There was music in the background. I suddenly felt sad that he was hanging out without me. But I pushed those thoughts away just a little more. When I came out of the bathroom, Jim noticed that I was sad and tried to hug me. But I pulled away. Better remember the code. We'll soon have something to eat. How could I help him remember the code? Got an idea. I took out our album and began to play the role of the worried wife. I showed him one picture after another. But Jim didn't react. How could he forget all this? And then he pointed to our picture from the Grand Canyon. It seemed that on this trip, he came up with a second figure. I decided not to delay and rented a Jeep and a Mexican guide. I hoped I was not wasting our last money, and he would remember the damn code. Three hours later, we were driving through the canyon, the guy talking cheerfully and Jim gazing thoughtfully at the scenery. When we stopped at the edge of the abyss, the Mexican suggested that we go out and take a photo. Jim was happy, but I was uneasy. The guy was looking at my back in a strange way. As soon as Jim and I got out, I felt someone pushing me toward the cliff. Give me the back or I'll push you over. The Mexican was coming at us. I looked into the abyss. One more step and we would fall. But suddenly Jim whispered, don't be afraid, and abruptly knocked the guy to the ground. Jim, what are you doing? While he was trying to restrain the Mexican, I began to call for help. But when I turned around, all I saw was the guide running away. Jim ran up to me and asked if I was hurt, even though he had a split eyebrow. And then I remembered that when I married Jim, he didn't have much money yet. But I knew I was always safe with him. Jim took my hand and said, look at the sunset. I looked up the sky and was speechless. Because of the stupid Mexican guy, we almost missed this beauty. We sat on the edge of the cliff until the sun went down. I waited a long time, but Jim didn't remember anything. When it was almost dark, I pulled Jim's arm and told him it was time to go. Come on, Jim. The world is still full of wonders. Suddenly, Jim abruptly got up from the ground and told me that I had helped him. He always called the Grand Canyon the eighth wonder of the world. The next number was eight. I threw my arms around Jim. We would open the damn safe soon. At home, I spent the whole evening flipping through our album. I wanted to know what other places might be important to him. Flipping through the pages with the photos, I was surprised to note. It seemed that sometimes I was really happy with him and it was not about the money at all. But now I had Robert. All my memories with Jim were in the past. And I lived in the here and now. In the morning, Jim took me for a walk around the neighborhood. To walk again? I was so sick of it. But he said he had an idea. We'd been wandering the streets all day. And I'd been longing to sit down somewhere. Fortunately, we came to a park with a gazebo. I rushed over and sat down on the first bench I saw. Then Jim asked me mysteriously if I remembered the place. His words gave me the creeps. This was the place where we met. On what day did we meet? Oh, I remember. April 26. He said he was very touched that I remembered the date. And then I added the two and six were the remaining digits of the code. His heart told me so. Jim approached me. Does he want to kiss me? We were interrupted by a call from Robert. Damn, not now. I hung up on him. But Jim noticed. Who is this? He asked. I hesitated, but quickly said that it was some kind of advertisement. We walked home in silence. I didn't understand. Why did I hung up on Robert? I wanted to be with Jim. I didn't even notice we were at the house. I immediately remembered the safe. I would get this over with soon. Suddenly, I heard a deafening noise coming from the office where the safe was. I opened the door and saw Robert with a gas burner, who was trying to open the door of the safe. When he saw me, he stopped for a second and said nervously, You're no good. I'll do it myself. Robert turned on the burner and quickly finished what he had started. The door gave way and opened. Jim had been watching the whole thing blankly. Robert and I were stunned. We looked inside. But there was no money there. Only my wedding photo with Jim. Wait, wait. I turned to Jim and said, is that what you called the most valuable thing? He smiled. My heart ached. 
Disappointed, Jim said that he had always kept the money in the basement. You can have it. It's in two old suitcases. And then he added quietly, I remember everything. But it's a pity that for you, money was the most valuable thing in life. Jim left. Robert ran happily down to the basement, and I couldn't move. After a while, Robert picked up the suitcases with the money from the basement and dragged me to the taxi. Hurry up to the airport before that jerk changes his mind and catches up with us, Robert said. In the taxi, I couldn't stop thinking. This picture and all the numbers in the code were connected to our memories. So, this was really the most valuable thing for him. Jim really cared about me. How did I not notice this for so many years? As soon as we arrived, Robert grabbed the suitcases with the money and jumped out of the taxi. Come on, get out, we have to go, he shouted angrily. But I was thinking, and I couldn't move. It was too hard to shut out my thoughts. Then Robert calmly said that he would go alone. After all, he finally had all the money, and then it became clear to me why he was trying so hard. In an instant, I slammed the door and shouted to the taxi driver. We're going back. I realized he really loved me all this time. No one was home. I was restless. But suddenly I remembered Jim saying goodbye to his homeless friends. Could he be there? I ran around the flop house, oblivious to the smell and the dirt. I was just about to leave when I noticed someone in the corner. And I came over quietly. It was Jim. I rushed to him and begged his forgiveness on my knees. What a fool I am, Jim. He loved me more than anything in the world. How could I not see that? I was sobbing, and Jim was holding me close and apologizing for not paying enough attention to me. When he remembered everything, Jim felt ashamed, and he decided to remind himself and me how good we were together, although we sometimes did not notice it. Without breaking our embrace, we left the flop house and went to the park, to our gazebo. And then Jim said, If you want, we can go to the club right now. But I already had a better idea. Let's have a hot dog. And we'll walk in the park until morning. Did you like the video? Then subscribe and like it. Support the channel. Thank you. I was on one knee in front of my girlfriend Mia, and the whole restaurant was staring at us frozen. I asked in a trembling voice, Will you marry me? But Mia was suspiciously silent for a long time. I was already nervous. And then she sighed, I'm sorry, I have a new guy. The world seemed to collapse. Mia excused herself and ran out of the restaurant. Speechless, I slowly sat down on the chair. It never occurred to me that Mia would not only reject me, but also would cheat on me. In middle school, I fell in love with this short <laughs> brunette with beautiful brown eyes. We started dating. When I went to college, she moved in with me. There wasn't enough money for everything. I got a job at an advertising agency. I had to work around the clock, and I started spending very little time with Mia. She certainly didn't like it very much, but I thought she understood everything. I tried for our sake. I wanted us to live well together and not need anything. I always told her that I loved her. Weren't words enough? And now when I finally decided to propose to her, Mia had a new guy. She left, and I just sat there. Finishing my third glass of wine, my heart was so heavy, so I dialed Zane, my best friend. Zane was trying to say something, but I wasn't really listening. I didn't even notice that I was walking into the roadway during the conversation. I was suddenly deafened by the car's horn. The last thing I remembered was a blinding glare of the headlights. When I opened my eyes, it took me a long time to recover. Was this a hospital? I had a terrible headache. I tried to remember what had happened, but then the door bursted open and a guy bursted in. When I looked closely, I didn't recognize his face. Who are you? He came up to me and, with a sigh, he blurted out, I'm Zane, your best friend. There was an accident. The doctor said you had a severe head injury and possibly partial memory loss. My stomach went cold with horror. Heck, Zane? Don't I remember his face? Wait, what about Mia? She must be worried. I took off running, but he shook his head and said sadly, I'm sorry, man, but Mia left you. It was like being doused with ice water. But how? I remembered how good we were together. I wanted to propose to her, but Zane told me not to worry. He would find a girl a hundred times better for me. The one who would truly love me very deeply. I smiled weakly and thanked Zane. Thank you for being here. I was soon released from the hospital and somehow got back to work. Zane immediately started a profile for me on Tinder with my picture on it and some cute girl immediately wrote me. I thought it was a good attraction. We decided to meet in a cafe. I came there straight from work and sat down at a table. Once in this cafe, I ate pancakes with Mia. The memory warmed my chest. 
the waitress came up to the table and told me to get lost. I looked at a girl in surprise. Her brown eyes seemed familiar, but she suddenly turned around and left. This was the first time I had met such a rude waitress. Maybe I didn't remember something, but just as I was about to get up, a tall blonde from Tinder came up to the table. Her name was Cheryl, and she sat down across from me and immediately started talking about proper nutrition. Cheryl talked for about three hours, and I was yawning when I noticed the waitress standing next to the bar. She was watching us intently, but when she saw me looking at her, she turned away abruptly. What had I done to her? Cheryl kept talking, not letting me get a word in. I excused myself, got up, and headed for the door. I didn't think it was going to work out with her. And half an hour later, I was sitting at Zane's house and telling him about our strange date with a beauty from Tinder. I had to admit, I miss Mia. It was so good to be with her. Could we get back together? When Zane protested, Mia was a stinker. She cheated on me. I dropped my head and Zane was right. Then his phone rang and Sweetie appeared on the screen. He immediately excused himself somewhat nervously and walked away. Come on, Zane, do you have a girlfriend? As long as I can remember him, he never dated anyone. Because of this, the three of us often went out together. Zane, me, and Mia. As soon as I thought of her, I felt sad again. So wait, there are still a lot of girls on the ground. After waiting for Zane, I talked a little more with him and then opened my Tinder account. It was time to go on a date. Soon I was sitting in the same cafe, but the girl from Tinder did not appear. I waited for her for an hour, which I could have spent on work. But then the negative waitress walked by. She grinned and quipped that I looked like I'd been dumped. But before I could answer, someone stumbled into the cafe, screaming. I turned around and saw a drunk man. He staggered to the sofa at the next table. The smell of alcohol immediately hit my nose. The man whistled, looking at the waitress, and he grabbed her arm as she passed by. What was this asshole doing? I got up and shouted to let the girl go, otherwise I would call the police. But the man only laughed impudently. In the next second, I walked around the table and grabbed the man by the collar. It's time to teach you respect. But the man was strong, he pushed me away. I fell right on the glass table behind me. The pain darkened my vision. I heard the screams of the guards running up and realized that the danger was over. He was quickly escorted out of the cafe. Then the waitress helped me up. She looked at my hand in horror. There was a fresh cut there. It looked like I got hurt when I fell on the table. The waitress immediately took me to the back room to treat the wound and she was nice to me for the first time. And suddenly, she thanked me for standing up for her. It's nothing, any guy would do the same. She touched my hand and said she didn't think I was so caring. What do you mean? But she immediately caught herself and left the back room, saying that it was time for her to work. I could still feel her touch. And then I decided to wait until the end of the shift to take her home. Maybe I might have a chance with her, right? After closing, I met her right at the exit and offered to walk her home. All I could hear was my heart pounding. I was like a schoolboy. The waitress looked at me mysteriously. I thought she would refuse, but then she smiled at me weirdly and said, Let's try it. I decided to introduce myself and immediately ask her name. Call me a stranger, she replied. Okay, a stranger. We talked on the way. We started discussing movies and it turned out that we were Marvel fans. And when I asked her what her favorite dish was, I was stunned. She was crazy about pancakes and jam, just like me. As soon as we reached her house, I decided it was time. My heart was pounding in my chest. I looked into her eyes and reached out to kiss her, but she suddenly recoiled. Are you out of your mind? It was like being doused with ice water. What's wrong? I asked. But the stranger just left without answering or even saying goodbye. The next day, after work, I met Zane and told him about the stranger who had turned me down. I thought I'd met the one and she'd rejected me. Heck, you know, she was even better than Mia. But Zane said I was too obsessed, so I didn't let anything new come into my life. He grabbed my phone and immediately opened Tinder and made a few more dates. I didn't resist. The stranger turned me down, but none of the girls could compare to the waitress from the cafe. I couldn't get her smile out of my head, and I compared each girl to her. In the end, I couldn't stand it. If I fell in love, then I needed to pursue it and not sit still. I had an appointment for work that evening, but I canceled. Bought a huge bouquet of flowers and headed to the same cafe. My stranger was standing at the bar. I plucked up the courage to go to her and hand her a bouquet of flowers. I stammered out, I will prove myself worthy of you. Just give me one chance. 
She was about to say something, but suddenly Zane came into the cafe and came up to us. What was he doing here? Zane suddenly hugged the stranger and frowned, throwing a displeased look at me. My jaw almost dropped. I tried to swipe her friend's girlfriend. From embarrassment, I wished for the ground to swallow me up. I took one last glance at the waitress and ran out of the cafe. I wandered the streets, thinking about the situation with Zane and his girlfriend. The stranger, it turned out. I took another step, and then a car honked loudly. I shuddered. It passed just a millimeter away from me. At that moment, it dawned on me. I suddenly realized that I remembered everything. I had a sudden vision of Mia's face. A lot of emotions surged at the same time. The stranger waitress was Mia. My girlfriend. So stop, but why was Zane with her? Then I realized that Mia had left me for him. My best friend. But then I began to remember how little attention I paid to her. And because of my work, I often ignored her request to go out together. Mia told me more than once how much she missed me, and I worked all the time. What a fool I was. I messed it up myself. Heck, but Zane, how could he do that? I clenched my fists. He had been hiding the truth all this time and manipulating me under the guise of supporting me. And all of that in order to take my girlfriend. I just turned around. He couldn't leave it like this. It was time to sort things out with Zane. I decided to go back to the cafe hoping Zane was still there. It was late, and there was almost no visitors. I was looking for Zane when I heard Mia's voice clearly coming from the back room. I listened. Mia was telling someone in a trembling voice, almost crying, that she still loved me. In recent days, when I was courting her, she realized I was her destiny, and that she regretted dumping me and it happened all like this. And then I heard Zane's voice, who kept saying that he was better than me. That I'd give up on me again, like I did before. Hearing his words, I threw open the door and walked in just as Zane pushed Mia. Mia! I managed to catch her and then glared at my former friend. They didn't expect me to remember everything, buddy. Zane tried to hit me, but I dodged him. I immediately hit him back. He would know, jerk. After that, Zane with his hand against his nose sarcastically wished us domestic bliss and left. I hugged Mia. So we stood in silence for 20 minutes. Then I came around and whispered, Will you go on a date, stranger? We never broke up again, and a month later I proposed to her again. Guess what she said? And I also realized if you love a person, words alone are not enough. The main way to show your love is to give your time and care. Did you like this video? Subscribe and like it. Support the channel, folks. Thank you so much. Mom! Mommy! Dad and I ran as fast as we could to the bus stop. I don't believe it. Dad, it's definitely her. We tried to shout over the noise of cars and pushed through the crowd of passersby. Mom, wait! But she got on a bus and drove away. Mom disappeared a year ago. My parents had a fight and my mother decided to go for a walk. She needed to wind down, but she never returned home. The police were powerless, so Dad went to a private detective. We did not hope, but a few months later, he called. My mother was found. The detective left us an address. We immediately rushed there. I was shaking with excitement. I missed her so much. I couldn't believe I was going to see her soon. We got out of the car and saw a luxury house. Wow, maybe we got something wrong. But no, everything matched. This was the house. We hesitated, then knocked on the door. It swung open and... Mommy, I couldn't believe my eyes. I ran to her, but she only greeted me politely and stopped back as if I were a stranger. Then she asked if I were the new neighbors who had bought a house nearby. Neighbors? Mom, what's wrong with you? But she looked at us as if seeing for the first time. We had to say something and Dad lied that yes. We recently moved to this nice area. My mother was delighted and invited us for tea. Inside, the house was even more luxurious. My mother led us into the living room and went into the kitchen. I took out our family photo to show her, but my dad stopped me and whispered to me not to do it. My mother came back with tea and cake. She said that she missed the guests. They rarely have anyone. I didn't know what was going on. It was like an angry prank. Did she hit her head or get sick? She really treated us like strangers. I was on the edge. I'm your daughter, mom. Suddenly, a man in a police uniform came into the living room. Mom immediately quieted down. Then she caught herself and introduced us to Steve. Her boyfriend. What? We couldn't believe it. Steve frowned and whispered something in my mother's ear. Mom apologized to us and immediately left. 
He was clearly not happy about dad and me. And while my mother was away, he gave us a real interrogation. Where we live, why we came, we had to get out of it. Dad named a house at random. And Steve wanted to ask something else. But mom came back and brought him warm slippers. She was clearly very nervous in front of him. Even her hands were shaking, although mom tried to hide it. Mom handed everyone another piece of pie. And Steve stopped her and told her sternly that it was time for dad and me to leave. Because mom wasn't in a position to receive guests. She needs to take care of herself. All the way home, we thought about what to do and what Steve had in mind. Was mom pregnant? We didn't know what was wrong with her. It couldn't be worse. Mom lived a different life, but it didn't look like she was crazy. Something must have happened to her memory. We decided to find a specialist to deal with this. We went to a psychologist and he confirmed her concerns. My mother had amnesia. She really forgot us, but the psychologist said that there was hope for recovery. She could be helped. He said to show her the memorabilia. It would awaken her memories of us. The main thing was not to tell the truth directly. Otherwise, it might hurt her even more. We went to see her again. Dad came up with a cool move to give my mother a blue rose in a pot. The same as on their first date. Mom was happy to see us, but she wouldn't let us in. Steve was home. Nevertheless, my father gave mom a flower and they thanked her for the tea and cake. Mom was delighted with the blue collar of the rose. She even said she'd seen one like it somewhere. Did she remember something? But then Steve appeared and abruptly asked us to leave. This time, he didn't even greet us. My mother tried to object, but he stopped her roughly. He slammed the door on us. We were walking reluctantly to the car when we heard the door open again. We turned around and saw Steve throw the flower out into the street. Mom was crying, but there was nothing she could do. Dad was about to go back and beat Steve. But I stopped him. We won't get mom back this way. Don't forget about our plan. I couldn't stop thinking about what I saw. How did she even get in touch with him? She was also pregnant with his child. I took her photo. My mother was beautiful in it. We were in the park that day eating ice cream. The park! We should have called mom to the park for a walk in her favorite places. Dad said it was a great idea. This was her favorite place in the city. The next morning, we watched the mansion from the car, waiting for Steve to leave for work. Then we immediately rang the doorbell. Mom was happy, but visibly nervous. She said that Steve was very jealous and dad's gift led to a real scandal. We tried to talk her into going to the park, but she was afraid. Steve called home every hour to make sure she was there. Mom said sadly that she hadn't been out for a long time and was tired of staying at home. My father and I tried to persuade her. We promised that we would be back like Winky. We said we didn't know anyone here but her. She smiled and agreed to walk for half an hour. I was so happy. In the park, we went around all the paths and rides, ate ice cream. Mommy, I hope you remember how happy we were here. Suddenly, Mom pulled my bangs off my face the way she usually did. What if... But then mother looked at her watch and the change passed over her face. She asked us to take her home immediately. I was a good girl, but she had to go. She had been with us too long. Steve would be angry. What an asshole. Steve had no right to treat her like this. She was not his property. Dad said that mom couldn't stay with this tyrant. She deserved better. Mom started to make excuses and say that Steve was very worried about her. But it was clear that she was very afraid of this comeback. He was just a goddamn manipulator. I already reacted for the photo. I wanted to tell my mother as quickly as possible that we were her real family. But then we heard police sirens. Steve arrived. He was furious and shouted that my mother shouldn't have gone out. We had to leave. Dad whispered to mom to call us when Steve went to work. We would help her escape. Before mom could respond, Steve grabbed her arm and pulled her into the car. He shouted at us to get away from his family. Otherwise, he would arrest us. Dad was furious. How this asshole behaved with my mom. I was shaking all over myself. But there was nothing we could do but wait for my mother to call. What if she didn't call? I tossed and turned all night and couldn't sleep because of these thoughts. But toward morning, the phone rang. Mom, she asked us to come and said Steve wasn't home. So she had decided to leave this asshole after all. We were at her house in a few minutes. 
The door was ajar. We knocked and heard my mother asking us to come in and wait for her to get ready. But when we were in the living room, we saw police officers in addition to my mother. Before we knew it, we were pinned down. This was horrible. I started to struggle and scream. No, let us go. Steve didn't go anywhere. He looked at us and grinned. It turned out that he found the house we were supposedly live. There were other people there, of course. Steve convinced my mother that we were scammers or thieves and asked her to draw us into a trap. It was terrible. My mother averted her eyes and tried not to look at us. I couldn't keep silent any longer. I began to tell my mother that we were not scammers. We were her family. And for some reason, my mother did not remember us. It was hard to speak and tears were choking me. I wriggled out of the policeman's hands and tried to get the photo out of my back with trembling hands. I so wanted my mother to see it and believe us. But as soon as I pulled out the photo, the cop pinned me down again and he put on the handcuffs since I didn't understand on good terms. Heck, our photo, it was gone. I asked the policeman to look for it but he wouldn't listen. We should have gone to the station. And mom? Mom didn't even look at us. Like at the bus stop. We tried to explain everything to the police, but they told us that my mother should confirm our words. How? She didn't remember us. We sat in the station for five hours. Everything seemed pointless. We were desperate when we heard my mother's voice. She was looking for us and she had picture in her hands. Mom, we're here. I ran to her. She said it was all a big mistake. That I was her daughter. She remembered everything. We cried with happiness. When everyone calmed down a little, my mother told us that she remembered us as soon as she saw the photo. Mom tried to explain everything to Steve, but he got mad and locked her in the mansion. She only managed to get out of the back door when he fell asleep. Dad asked her how she was feeling and if the baby was okay. Mom didn't understand what he was talking about at first. And then she laughed out loud. She was not pregnant. The fact was that Steve was paranoid about protecting my mother. She often had migraines and dizziness. And at some point, Gostadi became a tyranny. In fact, he was afraid that she would leave him. We were about to leave when mom stopped abruptly. She looked startled. Steve was standing in a dark doorway. His eyes were bloodshot. And he was shaking with rage and clenching his fists. Terrified, I immediately ran to the fire escape. I was chased by some bandits shouting, Give us your heart! Who are they? They were very close. There was no time to go down and I decided to jump. I landed right on the asphalt and in an instant, a hellish pain pierced my body. The bandits were already coming down to me, and I couldn't even move. Was this the end? Suddenly, a black car drove up to me. The door opened. I didn't understand anything. If you want to live, get in the car. The driver shouted. I woke up in an apartment somewhere. I looked around and couldn't figure out where I was. It was not that I didn't know where I was. I didn't know who I was. Hello? I shouted timidly, but there was no answer. Then I quickly walked through the rooms, but there was no one in them. I didn't remember anything at all. Hell, I didn't even know my name. In desperation, I walked from room to room. But suddenly my gaze stopped at the mirror. Was this really what I looked like? Wait, what's this? I timidly undid the buttons of my shirt and a nasty chill ran down my back. I had a huge torn scar on my chest. And there were deep rope marks on my wrists. What happened to me? This ignorance tormented me. In a panic, I rushed to sort through all the things in this damn apartment. I threw everything out of the cabinets and rummaged through the nightstands. I need at least some clue. I found a stack of photos on a shelf in the hall with completely different people. There were even children among them. What was the connection? Maybe I was a photographer. There was a video camera nearby, but there was not a single recording on it. There was a laptop on the table. I was already relieved, but I found only a bunch of some strange strange sights and bookmarks. My panic was growing. I wish someone would explain to me what was going on. Suddenly, I heard screams from the stairwell. A couple of seconds later, someone was already banging on my door. A cold sweat broke out on my forehead. I didn't know who it was, but I didn't think they'd come to help me figure it out. I didn't know what to do, but then the door lock turned with a crunch. I was numb. A gang of scumbags was looking at me from the threshold. 
One of them pointed at me and shouted, Give us your heart! Where to run to? I immediately rushed towards the fire escape. There were no other options. Thank God, I was on the second floor. The bandits were already very close. There was no time to go down. Then I closed my eyes and jumped. A second later, I was already lying on the asphalt, and my body seemed to be pierced by a thousand red-hot needles. I couldn't move, and these chilling cries were already heard above my head. Give us your heart. Mentally, I was already prepared for the worst. Was I going to die without knowing who I was? But suddenly I heard the roar of an engine. A black car stopped right in front of me. If you want to live, get in the car. I heard from the opening door. Gathering my strength, I made a dash. And in a second, we were already speeding through the streets of the city. Everything that had happened to me over the past few hours not only didn't fit in my head. It was like it was tearing me apart from the inside. Who was I? And why was all this happening to me? I wanted to ask the driver about everything, but I didn't even know where to start. He was surprisingly calm. Here, take it. My savior suddenly said, handing me a tablet. Perplexed, I took it. A video came on, and I saw people in business suits. One of them, I think, addressed me directly. He said that they had my heart. And now I had an artificial heart. They set a time, a place, and named the amount for which I could buy my heart. Damn. What? This was all some kind of big joke, right? I just refused to believe in this absurdity. But the driver was absolutely serious. Sarah, what's going on? What have you gotten yourself into? He said. I timidly told him that I didn't remember anything at all. What do you mean? I'm Garrett. Do you even remember that? I didn't remember Garrett at all, but I was glad. I hoped everything would become a little clearer thanks to him. But just as I gathered my strength and decided to ask a couple of questions, Garrett informed me that we needed to return to my apartment because I had the right amount there to buy my heart. After this statement, there were only more questions. Where did I get so much money from? What was I doing all my life? I timidly asked Garrett about it, but he just said that he would tell me everything later. And now we needed to hurry because the bandits could track us at any time. I didn't believe in everything that was happening. It seemed to me that I just suddenly turned out to be a character in a computer horror game. As soon as we arrived at my house, we immediately rushed into the apartment and I again had to turn over all its contents. But we didn't find a scent in any locker or any shelf. Maybe Garrett was wrong, but suddenly it dawned on him. He went into the bedroom and began to push the bed hard. I was stunned. There really was money under it. A lot of money. I didn't have time to figure out where I got them from. The amount was just enough to buy my heart. Garrett watched me closely as I hurriedly collected money into the first bag I came across. I was so grateful for his help, but suddenly, I felt uneasy from this look. I asked if everything was fine. Garrett just sighed and said that his sister was kidnapped a few years ago, and when he was looking at me, he involuntarily remembered her. I felt incredibly sorry for him. He said it with such regret. They must have been very close. It was time to get out, but suddenly Garrett announced that his car had run out of gas. That's okay, we'll take yours. Wait, so I also had a car? Even more perplexed, I followed Garrett into the courtyard of the house and saw only a large white van that resembled a butcher's truck. So this was my car, why did I need to buy such a monster? We got into the van. There was almost no time. We were late. Garrett hit the gas and we quickly drove to a meeting with people in suits from that video. I still couldn't understand anything. It seemed that I was just going on autopilot. We drove up to a rather creepy abandoned building. They must be doing their terrible things here. We hurriedly climbed to the last floor and were surprised. The room was well renovated and well lit inside. And the strangest thing was that there were dozens of cameras hanging on the walls. It seemed that they filmed every millimeter of the room, and in the very center of the wall hung a huge screen. I looked around and some remnants of memories stirred in my mind. Finally, apparently, I had already been here. Maybe this was where my heart was cut out. Suddenly, my eyes went dark, and pain shot through the back of my head. I had time to look back. Behind me, Garrett was grinning, wiping my blood from the bat. For what? I woke up tied to a gurney. Everyone was standing around me. Everyone in general. Those people in suits from the video, Garrett, the bandits who were hunting me. What's happening? 
Garrett, what's going on here? He went to the screen and turned on the video. Unable to do anything else, I stared at it. The video showed the same white van. My car. It stopped in front of some gas station. Apparently, it was the middle of the night. Only one passerby was hurrying somewhere. Suddenly, several people in ski masks got out of the van. I didn't understand anything at all. They grabbed that guy, roughly tied him up, and pushed him into the van. What was this all about? But then one of them took off the mask. And I was under it. A lump rose in my throat. That's not possible. I couldn't do it. Tears came to my eyes. I looked at Garrett, and he just grinned again. That's not all. Other scenes flashed on the screen, but the plot remained unchanged. I and my assistants caught people on the streets and pushed them into a van. Some of them resisted, and then I also beat them. Everyone was there. Women, children, old people. This just couldn't be happening. How could I have been so cruel? Then the footage from this room appeared on the screen. I was doing surgery on these people. These scenes almost made me sick. I was choking on tears and I still couldn't understand anything. Garrett seemed to enjoy my desperation. He came over and bent over me. I couldn't stand his piercing gaze and looked away. In a chilling tone, he told me that for years I had been kidnapping people and doing experimental surgeries on them, purely out of curiosity. I also aired all this on the darknet, right from this room. He really had a sister, who also became one of my victims. No. No, no, it just couldn't be me. But suddenly, flashes of memory began to return to me. I remembered some episodes, how I dragged someone into the van, how I took out a scalpel, and then I felt satisfied. This just couldn't be happening. Garrett, meanwhile, continued. He spent a couple of years trying to find out who stole his sister, and a month ago, he finally identified me. But he couldn't just get rid of me like that. He really wanted revenge. Garrett said that I had been living like a groundhog day for a month. They injected me with a drug to block my memory, charged the artificial heart for another day, and ran the same scenario. And the most important thing was that my airing did not stop. Now the audience watched me suffer every day. It turned into a new entertainment, a very popular show. Now you understand the desperation of these people. With these words, he came up and gave me an injection. I remembered everything. No, he'd better get rid of me. My vision went dark again. I woke up in an apartment somewhere. I looked around and couldn't figure out where I was. It was not that I didn't know where I was. I didn't know who I was. Did you like the video? Subscribe and like it. Support the channel. Thank you.